Thank you. Um, there's absolutely no irony to being the last talk of the day and talking about sleep, right? <laughs> So uh, as I already discussed with an audience member, naps are fully encouraged for the next 30 minutes, but please keep your snoring to a minimum. Um, you know, I, I have come to the realization that sleep is probably the most important determinant of health. And it is something that we put on our priority lists after everything else. We work before we sleep. We play before we sleep. We go on Facebook before we sleep. We do the laundry before we sleep. We watch Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead before we sleep, right? We have everything else on our to-do list, and sleep is always the thing we do with whatever time is left over with the day. And yet, sleep is probably the most profound input to our health. And even with that being said, we've only understood sleep well from a physiological perspective for a few years. And the first studies, the, the really well-designed studies to look at ancestral sleep patterns were only published last year. So I'm going to go over that research as much as I can in this short period of time. I'm going to talk about how we can use that insight uh, to better our own health through better sleep habits. So a recent study just published uh, last summer looked at three different pre-industrialized societies. Uh, a small subgroup of the San who still live as hunter-gatherers, the Hadza, who are of course um, what considered perhaps one of the last true hunter-gatherer populations in the world, and the Chimane, who are uh, isolated hunter-horticulturalists. And they attached an act watch onto these people and, and looked at their sleep patterns. They also um, attached temperature probes to them and around their um, sleeping places and collected data for 10, 11-day periods of time at different times of the year. So an act to watch um, measures sleep by looking at movement and light. So it is something like a slightly more sophisticated Fitbit. Let's face it, it is not the same level of accuracy as a polysomnogram, um, but it's very non-invasive. It does have the um, tendency to misinterpret light sleep and REM sleep as wakefulness. So we can take these numbers with a little bit of a grain of salt um, and think that probably total sleep and sleep efficiency is a little bit higher than the data that we're actually getting from the ActiWatch. So this is the data. And there is a lot of information on this slide. So these are um, a 24-hour day of four representative sand peoples in summer and in late fall. The black squiggly lines are activity. The yellow lines that you can barely see is sunlight. The blue highlighted area is where the ActiWatch algorithms detect sleep. And that little aqua green blue, I don't know what to call that color. We're going to go with not blue, but not really green on the edges of the blue. Here I can point out like a larger patch right there. That is very, very low activity, but that's not actually triggering the algorithm and being detected as sleep. So one of the things that I want you to, to sort of visually see from this figure is that variation from person to person is not that great. And in actual fact, variation from day to day was very, very low. You can see actually fairly high amounts of activity throughout the day. And when we actually start looking at averages, the patterns that we see are this. So these hunter-gatherer or hunter-horticulturist pre-industrialized societies, they sleep um, on average 6.9 to 8.5 hours a night. Now that is the time from sleep onset to offset. It's when they first fall asleep at the beginning of the night and when they wake up in the morning. When you subtract the brief wakings at night, when you subtract that first stage one sleep called sleep latency time, that's usually taken off of total sleep time uh, if you do a polysomnogram, um, their total sleep in that time is 5.7 to 7.1 hours. That equates to a sleep efficiency of something like 85%. And that is absolutely equivalent to normal sleep in a healthy adult living in a Western culture. So some other interesting things. They typically go to bed a couple of hours after sunset. So the sun sets, they light a fire, they have this quiet time around the fire, they start to isolate into small family groups of you know, four to eight people, um, very, very low activity levels, but it's social time and very intimate time. 
then finally they actually go to sleep something like three hours after the sun goes down, right when the temperature is getting cooler. They usually wake it in shortly before sunrise. And what's very interesting, I'm not going to actually go into this much more in this talk because there's so much to, to go through, but this is not biphasic sleep. This is uninterrupted sleep for seven to eight and a half hours. So they are not experiencing um, long periods of wakefulness at night. So what's really interesting about this study is it went and looked at some of the major zeitgebers. Okay, so these are things in our environments that drive our sleep-wake cycles. So things that have a huge impact on our circadian clock and our sleep drive. And the, the number one zeitgeber for us is the light-dark cycle. So our circadian clock in our brain is synced with the sun. So we need that bright light signal during the day to say, hey, it's daytime, we should prioritize daytime-like activities like the search for food or, you know, a commute into work, depending on where you live. Um, and we really need the darkness signal to tell our brain that it's nighttime. We need to prioritize nighttime-ish things like sleeping and re restoring and repairing. So the, these hunter-gatherer populations sleep very, very in tune with the sun. Um, and so that means that they've got seasonal variation, so they're sleeping more in the winter than they are in the summer. But their, their timing of sleep onset and sleep offset relative to what the sun is doing is very entrenched, very predictable, and very consistent. So in this graph, black is activity level again. This red line is a, a binary activity measurement, so it's were they active or were they not. Um, yellow is light intensity. Here is sunset, here is, I mean, so sun, sunrise, here is sunset, and this blue dotted line is when they're sleeping. So you can see this pretty big period of time um, where these hunter-gatherers are having this quiet, intimate time, very low activity levels, right? You can see activity starting to drop off there before sleep onset. That seems to be really important. And you can see that um, their, sl their sleep offset, their waking up time, is times very, very closely to sunrise. Another major zeitgeber that this study was able to, to look at in depth was temperature, ambient temperature. So what we're finding is that hunter-gatherers fall asleep right around that initial dip in temperature after the sun goes down, right? So the sun goes down here, the temperature starts dropping, and that's when they go to sleep. And they're waking up right around when the temperature starts to do its turnaround, right? It hits its low and it starts coming back up. And we know that temperature can be a profound determinant of sleep quality. And um, it's very interesting to see just how well synced hunter-gatherer sleep patterns are with ambient temperature. So overall, this is the picture that we've got. So hunter-gatherers wake up roughly around sunrise. They're quite active throughout the day when the sun is at its brightest. Um, so they're, they're hunting and gathering food, doing other important things for survival. Then in the afternoon, they're seeking shade, so their activity level is dropping and their light exposure is dropping because they're actually seeking darker places. When the sun goes down, they light fires. They have quiet, quiet time. Quiet time? Can I call it quiet time? They're not reading each other's stories, but I mean, close, right? And then they're going to bed a few hours after sunset. So what does Western sleep look like in comparison? <laughs> not quite the same, right? But all jokes aside, and aside from the fact that we like to self-medicate in order to mask our fatigue and pretend to live through our lives as though we are getting enough sleep when in actual fact, pretty much probably every person in this room is not actually making, getting it, what sleep levels our bodies actually need consistently. But our, our normal days look quite different. So we get up maybe a little bit later, right? Like later than sunrise. We live indoors most of the time. We get these brief spikes of light when we go outside to get into our cars. Um, we are spending our time commuting, uh, sitting at school or sitting at our jobs. We're not getting that um, very consistent level of light to moderate activity throughout the day. Uh, and then we're exposed to ambient indoor lighting at night. So the sun goes down, but we're not in the dark. Um, and we know that this light exposure in the evening is one of the biggest suppressors of melatonin production, melatonin being the hormone that drives um, our need for sleep. 
And we tend to um, be able to push ourselves to a later bedtime because of this wonderful thing called indoor lighting. So our, our day is structured very, very differently and it's impacting our sleep. And in fact, the amount that we sleep has gone down dramatically in the last 50 years. Um, you know, it's, these are surveys that um, really ask people, like, how much did you sleep last night? Um, so you have to keep in mind that this is very uh, semi-quantitative, right? There's, you have to take this data with a grain of salt. Um, but you can see a pretty intense trend. And depending on, I mean, if you were, I've seen various versions of cherry-picked of these data points. I tried to put all of them on one graph that I could find. Um, but we're getting anywhere between an hour and two hours less sleep a night than we were 50 years ago. And when you think about sleep recommendations, right? So um, we're all told we need seven to nine hours of sleep at night or that gold standard of eight hours of sleep a night. Well, the fact is that only 35% of us are getting eight hours of sleep every single night. And 35% of us aren't ever hitting that minimum seven hours of sleep a night. This is a pretty major situation. And this is self-reported sleep numbers. So think about self-reported sleep for a second. How much sleep did you get last night? So how are you going to figure that out? Well, you're going to think about what time you turned out your light. Or maybe if you're a person who tends to take a little bit longer to fall asleep, you're going to think about what was the last time you saw on the clock? And then you're going to think about what time your alarm went off in the morning. Or if you were like me and you woke up 16 minutes before your alarm woke up, went off in the morning, I don't know why, um, you're going to think about that time, right? And you're going to do some math, and you're going to be really frustrated that it's a 12 hours and not 10 hour day, but whatever. And you're going to come up with a number. And you're going to say, I slept seven hours and 20 minutes. Well, when you think of time that way, you are overestimating how much you slept because you're not accounting for sleep latency. You're not accounting for brief wakings in the night. Unless you're tracking your sleep with something like a Fitbit, you're probably overestimating your sleep by something like 48 minutes. But here's what's really interesting about research that's compared self-reported sleep with actually measuring it with a polysomnogram is that the less you sleep, the more likely you are to over-report by a big number. So if you sleep five hours a night, you are likely to over-report by an hour and 20 minutes. So you think you got six hours and 20 minutes of sleep, you really got five. And if you get more sleep, something like seven hours, chances are good you're only going to over-report by 20 minutes. Now, why do I mention this? I mention this because we're comparing ancestral sleep with modern Western sleep. And so we're looking at 6 to 9, uh, 6.9 to 8.5 hours of sleep measured quantitatively by wrist actigraphy. And we're comparing that to surveys that say currently we're averaging 6.7 to 7.2 hours a night self-reported sleep. So the situation is probably much worse, and we probably aren't hitting the lowest number that hunter-gatherers are hitting on average in our society now. So why is that important, right? Okay, so you might say, well, look, 6.7 and 6.9 are not really different numbers, right? You might be like, whatever, come on. I'm, I'm going to go listen to the other talk in the other, the other room. This is why sleep is important, and we've only known this for a few years. So we have a toxic waste clearance system in our brains called the glymphatic system. Okay, the glymphatic system is flow of cerebrospinal fluid and interstitial fluids from the arteries to the veins in our brain, and it kind of flushes metabolic byproducts, right, the toxins that build up just because our brains are amazing things, and it flushes it towards lymphatic vessels that are near, um, near the venous vessels in our, in our brain, and they enter the lymphatic vessels and that's how they leave because these are toxins that can't cross the blood-brain barrier. Well, when we sleep, the parenchymal cells in the brain shrink by about 60%, which increases the space between them, which makes this flow phenomenally more efficient. So we need sleep to flush out the metabolic byproducts in our brain that build up while we're awake. So if we do not get enough sleep, we do not sufficiently flush out these toxins from our brain. So what does that do? Well, that interferes with neurotransmitter um, communication, and it stimulates microglial cells. So it stimulates brain inflammation. From there, you have set up all of the different brain whatever axes to be bad, right? You've set up the gut-brain axis and the, uh, you know, the, the brain-adrenal axis. You've, you've set up all these axes to not work correctly. So you're impacting now, you're impacting the immune system, you're impacting hormone systems, you're impacting digestion, you're impacting skin health. 
everything else comes from brain health. And we see this very strongly in our links to disease. So when you're not getting enough sleep, it's not just that you have to have your coffee in the morning. It's that your health deteriorates. We see this very clearly in all-cause mortality. Now, all-cause mortality is an excellent measure of general health. It takes into account um, it's our risk of dying from any cause, so that's accidental death, but also death from any disease. But it also, because of that, it's also death from old age, so it incorporates um, an indicator of longevity into the measurement as well. We know that sleeping less than six hours a night, which 35% of, of Americans do right now, um, increases risk of all-cause mortality by 12%. Now, let me put this into perspective. Being obese increases risk of all-cause mortality by 18%. Smoking is really bad, right? That doubles risk of all-cause mortality. For every hour that you are physically active and that replaces sedentary time, you can decrease your risk of all-cause mortality by 16%. And for every servings of vegetables that you add to your diet, up to five servings, you can drop your risk of all-cause mortality by 5%. So sleeping six hours a night is comparable to being obese, being sedentary, and not eating very many vegetables. And yet, we put sleep at the bottom of the to-do list. So I'll remind you, of this declining sleep over the last 50 years, because you're about to see a lot of graphs of increasing disease risk over the same period of time. Let's start with cardiovascular disease. So we know that incidence of cardiovascular disease is continuing to increase, even though survival is improving. Survival is improving because medical advancement that keeps us alive after developing cardiovascular disease is improving, not because the incidence is decreasing. So sleeping less than six hours a night increases risk of congestive heart failure by 67%, coronary heart disease by 48%, and doubles risk of stroke and myocardial infarction. This is a separate risk factor from obesity, from smoking, from having type 2 diabetes. Speaking of type 2 diabetes, uh, getting less than six hours of sleep a night uh, increases risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 50%. Now, this is even worse when you factor in impaired glucose tolerance. So if you lump people with impaired glucose tolerance and type 2 diabetes together, sleeping less than six hours a night uh, increases risk by 2.4 times, right? more than doubles risk. And what's really fascinating about this is we know that even a single night of sleep, um, a short sleep, so that's you know, four hours of sleep, causes insulin resistance. We know that a single night of lost sleep can impair insulin sensitivity more than six months of a high-fat, refined, Western-style diet. So we think of all of the things we're talking about in terms of food and diabetes risk. This is the low-hanging fruit. This is the easiest thing to address. Let's turn off the television and go to bed. And I'm, as I'd like to repeat that I totally endorse naps during this talk. So sleep and obesity risk, this is separate, right? Separate from other things that are Im impacting obesity. Sleeping less than six hours a night increases risk of obesity by 55% in adults, 90% in children. Now that may be because children are more sensitive, more sensitive population. It more likely just represents the fact that children need more sleep than adults. And so getting six hours for a child is an even larger sleep debt. But the sleep and obesity research has given us some of the most valuable insight into the effects that sleep have on health. And actually, um, there's the most echoes here in terms of the importance of sleep in comparison to the ancestral health um, perspective. Because variability in bedtime, now remember those hunter-gatherers went to bed about the same time every single night. Variability in bedtime during the week of greater than two hours increases risk of obesity by 14%. So that means that you go to bed at 10 p.m all week, and then you stay up till midnight to go out one night during the weekend. Okay, that, that, that pattern, which anyone in here not do that? Okay, there's one person at the back. Okay, two people. Two people in here never go out, <laughs> right? I mean, uh, we'll, we'll, plan, we'll plan a good event for you, and we'll <laughs> change that out, okay? Um, so that really, really common lifestyle choice in Western cultures increases the risk of obesity. Now, variability in sleep duration, separate 
from bedtime increases risk of obesity. So for every hour of standard deviation in your bedtime, so maybe you, or in your amount of time that you're asleep, so maybe you get six and a half hours sleep during the week, and then you sleep 10 hours, right? Sleep in Saturdays and Sundays. Um, that variability is increasing risk of obesity by 63%. And we also know that being synced with the sun, which of course the hunter gatherers are, is very, very important. So just being a late to bed, late to rise person, this is not shift work. This is just being a person who likes to go to bed at 1 p.m., okay? That doubles risk of obesity compared to somebody who's early to bed, early to rise. So within this physiological data, right, within these, I mean, some of these are very, very large meta-analyses, we're seeing reinforcement for hunter gatherer sleep, um, uh, sleep patterns. <coughs> Cancer and sleep maybe doesn't have as strong of a link um, as other chronic diseases, um, but sleeping less than five hours a night does increase risk of colorectal adenoma by 50%. And we do know that at least in breast cancer, that how much you sleep at the time of diagnosis is predictable for survival. So the more you sleep, the more likely you are to survive a breast cancer diagnosis. And of course, with autoimmune disease, um, there's been very, very few studies looking at any potent potential connection with sleep. But we know that non-apnea sleep disorders, so that's insomnia, and in this case, the very wishy-washy definition of insomnia of maybe once a week I have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, that that increases risk of autoimmune disease by 50%. Having obstructive sleep apnea doubles risk of having an autoimmune disease. Being a shift worker increases risk by 50%. And we also know that short sleep or sleep deprivation can be a, a major uh, trigger for autoimmune flares. So these are all conditions that have increased in incidence dramatically over the same time as our sleep has decreased. And we can see in the um, risk analyses that there is a direct link. And what's fascinating is if you look at something like cardiovascular disease risk, being, not getting enough sleep increases risk of cardiovascular disease, but not getting enough sleep increases risk of obesity. If you're obese, that increases risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's compounding because it's increasing risk of something that's also going to increase risk. Not getting enough sleep, by the way, increases risk of addictive behaviors. It increases risk of food addiction, uh, tobacco use, and drug use, and alcohol use. All individual risk factors for cardiovascular disease, for metabolic syndrome. So there's, there's a, a really profound link here and something that cannot be ignored. So when we look at the hunter-gatherer data, and we look at what we know in terms of the links between sleep and disease risk, there's some really strong common themes. We know that a consistency in bedtime and wake time are very important. So sleeping in needs to be a thing of the past because we shouldn't need to sleep in. We should get this, the amount of sleep that we need every single night. There should never be a drive for additional sleep. Seven to eight and a half hours, maybe nine hours, is probably about right for most of us. But there is some evidence um, that people with chronic disease do need more sleep. We know that high light, act light during the day, being outside, and a day full of light to moderate activity is very important for sleep quality and sleep drive. We know that being in a dim environment, I mean, that doesn't mean that you have to start creating a you know, fire pit in the middle of your kitchen in the evenings, um, but replicating that with red lights, with candle lights, with um, blue blocking glasses, which I'll get to again uh, shortly, it's very, very important for protecting sleep drive and sleep quality. We can replicate the temperature drops that hunter-gatherers are experiencing with our temperature-controlled environments in our home. There's no reason why we can't let the temperature fall at night. You know, especially in the winter, it saves on our energy bills too, right? And we know that the evening needs to be a time for more intimate social connection and not a time for partying. Unfortunately, that's when most of us have time to party. Um, but that's not very good from a sleep perspective, which of course means it's not good from a health perspective. So how, what are, how do we take these lessons and how do, we, how do we make choices during the day that are going to support sleep and then therefore support optimal health? So we don't have to give up our wonderful comforts of Western society and live in togas and start living in the bush, right? That's not what I'm asking. I mean, if that's your thing, go for it. 
Um, but the number one thing we need to do is just be aware of how vitally important sleep is so it makes it onto the to-do list. I mean, there's lots of things that we, um, we can do during the day, which I will talk about in the next few slides, that will support good quality sleep, support circadian rhythm entrenchment, but at the end of the day, it just needs to be a priority. We just need to know that we need sleep and it's important to us and we choose sleep over other activities. And then we need to make sure that our sleep environment is conducive to sleep, that we're entrenching our circadian rhythms and that we're regulating hormones that impact sleep. I mean, those things are not that hard to do. And especially within the ancestral health movement, many of the choices we're already making are, on the right, are in the right direction. So let's talk about priority first. Let's talk about routine. Let's talk about making sleep a priority. Who in this room has a bedtime? Ah, that's a lot of hands. Who in this room just goes to bed whenever it's, they are done, whatever? Yeah, right? We, we ended up about 50-50 there. I, I thank you for your honesty, really. Um, I think that's really common. We enforce bedtimes for our kids, and then our bedtimes are just whenever we're done our to-do list. But we, need, as adults, need bedtimes. We need that line in the sand. This is what time I go to sleep, and whatever I didn't get done today can wait till tomorrow. And if I'm consistently not getting done what I need to get done, then I need to reevaluate my priorities to make sure that sleep is one of them. Um, ideally, we would be in bed for eight to nine hours. So some of the data that I didn't show from the hunter-gatherers, they, they're sleeping, the time from sleep onset to offset is right, seven to eight and a half hours, but they're having that three hours of quiet time in their sleeping spaces, visiting with their immediate family or their partners before they fall asleep. It's kind of like they're spending 10 or 11 hours in bed. So that's not necessarily the easiest thing for us to replicate, but we can start thinking about spending more time in bed than actual our sleep targets in order to ensure that we get our sleep targets. It's pretty normal to take 30 minutes to fall asleep. So think about that as we're setting our bedtimes. Hunter-gatherers are getting like two, three hours of wind down time. Maybe we could do an hour. Maybe we could do an hour that's in a dim environment where we're not doing something intellectually stimulating and not, we're not watching zombies kill people on TV, okay? <laughs> Consistency is critical. Making that bedtime, sticking to it. And ideally that bedtime should be early enough that we never ever feel the need to sleep in. Ideally we would wake up at the time that we need to wake up to fulfill our you know, adult responsibilities, blah, 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 without an alarm clock, okay? That's the ideal. We're allowed to take baby steps, guys. It's, so, like, it's okay, don't have to rip off the Band-Aid. But that's the ideal. That's the thing that's worth working towards. It's really important to not self-medicate to mask fatigue. We need to be able to listen to our bodies so we can actually tell how much sleep we need. Um, and it's really helpful to sync with other household members. So I know as a parent of a nine and a six-year-old that when my kids go to bed, I'm like, yes, right? I'm not the only one, right? Please tell me I'm not the only one. Okay. Um, so it's really hard for me to embrace going to bed shortly after they go to bed. But frankly, that's what I need to do. And so I have to find my like alone adult time elsewhere. I mean, they're school age, so we're good. But like, it's just embracing a different way of thinking about things. Now our bedrooms need to be dark, cool, quiet, comfortable, non-stimulating, and dedicated spaces. So you know the old adage, your bedroom should only be used for two things, sleep and the other thing that adults do together time, sometimes. Those are the two things that should be happening in a bedroom. Do, so, please tell me you guys don't want me to spell this, spell this out, right? Everyone got it? Sense of well-being. Well okay, we've got a great euphemism over here. Um, this is really important, and especially darkness, right? So whatever you can do to make your bedroom dark, that's a, that's a really key part to sleep quality. Keeping your bed, bedroom cool and, you know, I mean, comfortable. I mean, the hunter-gatherers sleep on the ground, on like a grass mat with no pillows. Okay, let's, let's enjoy some of the comforts of Western society, right? <laughs> Circadian rhythm entrenchment. I mean, the, the number one thing is the bright light during the day and the, the dim light in the evening, the darkness at night. So we can go outside. I mean, I know that's a really revolutionary idea. Um, but if that's not accessible, we can replicate that bright light exposure with uh, a light therapy box or some lamp. And we can replicate the dim environment with um, using red light bulbs or something like Philips Hue light bulbs, wearing amber tinted glasses, avoiding screens, using something like Flux or Night Shift on Apple devices. Routine for meals, exercise, and temperature is really important 
for us in Western societies because of our other uh, factors that are inhibiting good circadian rhythm entrenchment. So we know that these are all things that improve sleep quality. And again, during the day, you need to be active and social and outside, and that's when we can watch zombies killing people, and in the evenings, quiet, intimate, dimly lit. So hormone regulation, if we're eating within an ancestral template, we're doing a lot of these things already, but some of the added things that we can do um, is not eat for at least two hours before we go to bed. Um, there's some studies that actually indicate that dinner optimally should be four to five hours before we go to sleep. Uh, avoiding sugars in the afternoon other than whole food sources like fruit, although like let's not go to town. Um, a diet rich in fiber and moderate in fat is the, the optimal diet for um, sleep quality. When we're dealing with sleep issues, a mild caloric deficit can actually be pretty therapeutic um, for mild sleep pathologies, although if you're dealing with something major, like get a doctor, please, um, and reducing stress. And this is one of those great two-way streets because the best thing that you can do to mitigate stress is get enough sleep. Getting enough sleep just by itself regulates your cortisol response to psychological, psychological stressors during the day. And then working on reducing stress is like the number one thing you can do for optimizing sleep quality. So you get extra bang for your buck. But I want to emphasize that the number one thing that we can do for sleep is to take our bodies, put them into our beds, turn out the light, turn off the television, which shouldn't be in your bedroom, move it tomorrow though, and close our eyes. And that when we do that, we can enjoy ancestral sleep in the modern age. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was really terrific. Um, and I have to say, seems easily doable, too. So, um, and I'm just going to take the um, moderator's prerogative to ask a question. So, what do you think is the biggest inhibitor of us not doing this? I mean, there's a lot of things, but what would you say is like the biggest reason why people wouldn't do this? You know, I, like, I want to blame indoor lighting, but I actually think it's a, it's a cultural shift. So I think we are facing a time where we're working more than we've ever worked before. There's more dual income households than there's ever been before. We're also trying to do work-life balance, which we interpret not as taking time to sleep, but taking time to play and go out with our buddies and have our girls night out and whatever it is. We're spending more time in front of screens than we ever have before. And like when you think of all the things we do more than we ever have before, where that is taking away time from is sleep. That's the one thing we're not doing more of than we ever have before. And so I think it's, a, it's really just a cultural shift in the sense that we, you know, we have all these idioms, right? I'll sleep when I'm dead. Um, I had a, a graduate student that I, I mentored who used to say, sleep's for the week. And she really felt that if she felt tired, it meant she wasn't strong enough, right? She was in pre-med, so right, there you go. Um, and so I think that the biggest thing we need to do is wrap our heads around the choices that go into freeing up time in order to sleep. From there, I think sleep quality can still be a struggle, and that's where all of the circadian rhythm entrenchment, hormone regulation, and all of that stuff comes in. Yeah, please. Thank you so much. I, I stayed awake the whole time. Oh, yes! I, I've been, for years, I've been espousing the importance of sleep and that it's more important than nutrition and exercise. I agree with you. So um, thank you for bringing that out into the forefront. I, my question is about the second sleep, and I, I, don't, I haven't researched this much, but I'm wondering if you, could, if you know about that, if you could speak to it, because yeah. it didn't look like on the graph they had no, that. No, so, so that was actually a surprise, so, uh, especially in the winter. Now, these three hunter-gatherer societies were all not too far from the equator, so their nights are not that long. But we see in cultural references this reference to second sleep, especially in more northern climes. Um, so going to sleep and then being awake for two hours in the middle of the night and then having a, a second, right, that second sleep, biphasic sleep patterns. That wasn't seen in hunter-gatherers. That doesn't mean that it's abnormal for us living where there's longer nighttime. And I've certainly talked with people whose bodies really, that's their natural sleep patterns. And I, I think it's okay to embrace that as a natural sleep pattern if we're sure that there's not a cortisol problem happening, right? Like, for sure it's not some shenanigans from somewhere else in the body. Um, but the, the big trouble for that is the added time commitment in bed in our current culture. So now you're talking about spending 
10 or 11 hours in bed because you've got to account for two hours in the night that you can't be super productive because it wrecks your second sleep quality if you're turning on a light. So it's time for intimate relationships with a spouse if you're lucky enough to have a spouse on the same type, type of sleep patterns. Or it's um, time for meditation, time for thought, time for you know introspection. Um, but I think that it certainly doesn't appear to be the normal sleep pattern. It may be a normal sleep pattern. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you for that talk. So um, beyond the behavioral factors that people do have control over in order to increase sleep patterns, it seems like a major issue for a lot of people now is sleep apnea. And you, mm -hmm. you touched upon that briefly. You know, it seems... I have the perception that sleep apnea is more common now, and I know it's been related to obesity and an increase in fat mass, but I know that's also not the only factor that contributes to sleep apnea. And I'm kind of curious, I imagine the data on sleep patterns among hunter-gatherer traditional societies is pretty sparse, but have you come across anything talking about the prevalence of sleep apnea in traditional human populations? I haven't seen anything um, now that could be two things. It could be that it doesn't exist. I mean, we see so little, right, chronic disease in these populations, period. We just don't see the same types of health problems that we have. And I would actually be su surprised if there was a, a, any sleep apnea in these populations, um, in part because their inflammation is so low. Mm -hmm. they're, um, they're so lean, right? These things that we know increase risk of, of developing apnea. Um, but I also don't know that anyone has specifically gone out to measure that. So um, it would be a really interesting, be a really interesting thing. But this whole idea of looking at hunter-gatherer sleep is pretty new. Do you have you seen a study? So uh, a couple presentations ago, there was a dentist. Let me speak into my um, there was a dentist and a pediatric dentist, and his position was that from looking at thousands of skulls, that um, the jaw position, that the jaw development was not. Uh, in, 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 in paleo per people um, did not lend itself to sleep apnea. I mean, and, that's very, yeah. It's and a very so that, 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 that's his position. So, yeah. yeah, you're right. I mean, from his perspective, you're right. It doesn't exist in those societies because uh, their jaw development is completely different. They uh, do have very different and, jaw and, and his pitch was to check children at very young ages and, and change their jaw, jaw development. So. Excellent. Hi. Hi. Okay, so first I just wanted to know if you have a reference or somewhere I can look into sleep deprivation's effect on brain function. Um, that would be of particular interest to my family. And then secondly is just if you have any advice on what the most convincing factor is when trying to convince the everyday person how important sleep really is. I feel like it's a subject everyone says, I know, I know, and they just aren't ready for the facts. I mean, that's, you can bring a horse to water, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so sleep, actually, lack of sleep has a pretty profound effect on memory, especially, um, but also our decision making, um, our ability to think through a problem logically. Um, it also has a pretty pr profound development on, a uh, profound impact on mood. Um, I've summarized that research in my online program called Go to Bed. Okay. Um, so that's a great place to go and then also find the scientific references to keep digging farther if, if you would like to. Um, and that's also an online program that I wrote specifically to give people that body of scientific knowledge to motivate them to make choices. That being said, that's not always enough for people. And at some point, you just have to let them make their own decisions. I guess I mean, just like in a conversation, I'm um, sure you have family or friends that you care about that you've been like, maybe you need to work on yeah. your sleep. <laughs> so I um, personally try very, very hard not to be evangelical about ancestral health with uh -huh. my family members. It hasn't worked out well right. in the past. Um, I try to be the resource for when they're ready to make changes. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, we get bombarded a lot with what we should do. Mm -hmm. um, I think that dropping a little, there's a lot of statistics in here, right? So whatever you think is going to be the, hey, did you know that when you don't get enough sleep, you on average eat 20% more calories? Right. Right. Some of that, some of those types of statistics can be really impactful for people. And it can be something like that that can trigger somebody to put. But then you, you have to be like an encyclopedia of sleep right. stats. Right. Uh, Which is totally normal and fine. Especially with, in this crowd. All right. We're all we're all nerds that way. Okay. 